Welcome back. We're talking about the significant weather and economic impact of El Nino. Let's get back to our panel. Let's go to Gerald in New York. Gerald, you talked a minute ago about uh, Southern Africa and the impact that El Nino is having there. Uh, South Africa produces uh, the country, a lot of the country, that region's uh, food. What are you hearing from farmers there? And of course, the added problem in South Southern Africa is that there is already chronic malnutrition in many countries of Southern Africa. Exactly. So it's a whole host of problems. As you say, South Africa, uh, the breadbasket of the region, or a breadbasket, bread uh, likewise Zimbabwe. Uh, but you have, and most of the food is, is produced, grown by smallholder farmers. Um, and, and they are especially vulnerable to the current El Nino. Uh, you know, we're very concerned that they won't be able to harvest enough uh, to feed their own families, let alone produce a surplus uh, to sell it. Um, so 50 million people across Southern Africa um, uh, live in areas that are highly exposed to the fallout of El Nino. Uh, presently, uh, there are 14 million people, one four million people in the region, um, particularly hungry. Uh, the weather forecasts for the coming months are pessimistic, uh, so the expectation is uh, that those numbers will rise. And it will get worse. Ryan, uh, you know, in the past few months, perhaps the past few years, we've been hearing a lot about climate change and China's role in it. China has been front and center of this. It's been affected by climate change. It has been coming up with solutions to combat climate change. If we look at one province in China, Liaoning province, which has had its lowest rainfall since 1951, um, that leaves about a quarter of a million people short of drinking water. And China also had its warmest year on record. Uh, that was last year, 2015. Is that being caused by El Nino or by climate change? Well, you know, globally, last year was the warmest year on record, we found out today right. from official data. Um, it's probably a combination of climate change and El Nino, local conditions, re regional conditions, circulations in the atmosphere. Um, we certainly know that with a changed climate, we expect uh, more extreme weather events like flooding and drought to occur more frequently. So it's certainly possible that that particular event could be uh, at least partially man-made uh, climate change showing up. But we know that El Nino too uh, causes, again, drought and heavy rainfall and, and potential for flooding across the globe. And again, with a warmer atmosphere, we're seeing heavier rainfall, but we're also seeing more intense droughts. So at the very least, climate change may be exacerbating the conditions there in southern China. El Nino is often followed by another weather phenomenon known as La Nina. What exactly is that? And should we expect it this time as well? It is. It's, it's sort of the opposite condition in the Pacific Ocean, where El Nino is warmer than average, long-term average waters around the equator. El Nino is cooler than average um, temperatures around the equator in the eastern and central Pacific. It certainly looks like this El Nino is easing and temperatures will be closer to normal toward the end of the year. Whether or not we move into La Nina, say, next year is still in question. Um, the impacts with, the weather impacts with La Nina tend to be less intense than with El Nino. So typically we're not talking about widespread flooding and drought in a La Nina event. Gerald, when we look at food prices going up because of shortages, does that have a ripple effect on people's lives? For instance, people are spending more money on food and then they have to spend less money on things like shelter, clothing, education perhaps? Absolutely. Uh, the people the World Food Programme serves are, are the most vulnerable people across the world, 80 million people in, in 80 countries. Uh, they already spend uh, all uh, or a large proportion of their uh, income on food. And if when prices go up, um, they are rendered even more vulnerable. So yes, uh, increased prices, uh, a huge concern. Camille, have you found in your work that some countries are better prepared to combat the effects of El Nino than others? And I mean, what can countries do to offset the impact? I mean, one of the things that can be done is to, uh, in, within a short period of time, like is done in India, the government can 
uh, issue short, you know, drought resistant uh, short duration crops, for, for instance, in the, that can massively help the agricultural sector. But uh, uh, we find less uh, evidence of that happening in the data in the sense that uh, historically El Nino episodes have led to uh, significant output losses in the, in particular the Asia Pacific region and some of the Latin American uh, countries. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, uh, in, in, the, in the U.S., uh, we actually observe uh, an increase, a boost to economic activity following uh, an El Nino. And that's not because of preparation, but uh, mostly because the weather is kinder. So we have lower temperatures, uh, we have uh, more rain, uh, and we have less natural disasters. So hurricanes in the east, uh, less tornadic activities in the Midwest. Uh, we have more rain in the south and uh, more rain in California. So uh, ba uh, agricultural sector. Uh, uh, increases, there is more stability to the oil sector, and uh, U.S. output goes up. Uh, sim similarly, in some of the Latin American countries, more rain does, uh, is not necessarily bad. So, for instance, in Argentina, uh, the soybean production increases, and they export about 95 percent of their soybeans. So, uh, in some parts of the world, uh, in India, there are programs to, uh, uh, you know, issue these uh, uh, drought-resistant short-duration crops. Uh, India has also, I believe, changed uh, uh, the proportion of crops that are grown in the monsoon season, uh, which obviously helps because uh, a weak monsoon is generally associated with uh, the El Nino. Ryan, you know, as you pointed out earlier on, this is cyclical. It is a naturally occurring phenomenon. Uh, but uh, have scientists been able to detect a pattern here? I mean, I guess the question is, can we predict what, when it's going to happen again? Well, typically El Nino happens every two to seven years, more often than not, every four to seven years. And we are getting better at predicting the frequency of, of those occurrences and, and when it will occur and, and how intense, because an individual El Nino event may be a weak event where the patterns across the globe, the weather patterns, aren't as changed as the current event, which is a very strong event, as we heard earlier. Um, climate change, there is some research it shows that uh, El Nino events will become more, these strong El Nino events will become more frequent as the globe continues to warm. So that's something that we have to look forward to or not in the future, that we may see more of these intense El Nino events. Right, so more frequent, will it get worse though? Uh, the impacts of the El Nino event, uh, these sometimes extreme heavy rainfall and flooding events could potentially get worse. Um, the warmer atmosphere is able to hold more moisture, so we're seeing heavier rain and snow events happening during El Nino years. And so certainly some of those local or regional impacts of climate change and uh, El Nino could be intensified. Gerald, when we look at the impact of El Nino, and we can see that you know it, it has a knock-on effect. It starts affecting various aspects of people's lives. Oxfam issued a report in which it said that El Nino will aggravate other problems like homelessness, and it referred specifically to the fact that 60 million people around the world have been forced to leave their homes because of conflict, as we have just seen in Syria. Um, so I guess for the UN, this is you have to have a very comprehensive solution to this problem. Sure. Um, what the World Food Program is doing in the immediate term is um, distributing emergency food rations to the most effective, eff affected. Um, we're giving out fortified nutritional products to particularly vulnerable groups like you know young children and, and pregnant and nursing women. Uh, we're prepositioning food in anticipation of uh, a, a surge in needs. But really, um, it, it, there are medium and longer term solutions that are absolutely required. Uh, there needs to be increased investment in disaster risk reduction, uh, in early warning, uh, in climate change adaptation, uh, and, and in the building of resilience. We've got to make communities and countries better able to withstand the impacts uh, of this phenomenon. Okay, and that's where we have to leave it. Thanks to all of you for joining us.